principal. This is the first time you all have had a school-wide community event. Is that true? Yes. All right. So let me tell you what I saw. Dr. Sumner wasn't in here, but what I saw was a group of scholars coming to this room ready to listen. So teachers, give them all a hand. Give them all a hand. show up in our building. What he doesn't know is he's looking at a bunch of scholars, entrepreneurs, we got some writers in the building, we have everything that we need to be successful. So we are so happy and honored to have you in the building. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Sumner so that she can get us going. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you for being here, Jason Reynolds. I'm gonna start by fangirling a little bit. The, the school knows me as Dr. Sumner, also Dr. Beyonce. Um, but my journey with you began when I was an educator at Fenway High School, and I had seen Trayvon, I had seen Tamir, I had seen Eric Gardner, I had seen Mike Brown, and I was an English teacher with a room full of babies who were looking at me like, what do I do? How do I handle this? And it wasn't until All American Boys that I, as an educator, found the language for it. And so I wanted to express my gratitude to you. This isn't a question. This is just expressing my gratitude to you. I wanted to thank you for being a seismic shift in black identity, in black dignity, in black legacy, in black thought, in black letters, and words for all young people, young people and the young at heart. So just as an educator, thank you very much. His mic ain't on, y'all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Sure. All right, now for the questions. So the definition of the word prolific is marked by abundant inventiveness and productivity. Bro, you got 21 books yeah. and loading. Yeah. He's, yeah. I'm working, you know what I mean? Like, what is your recipe? for continuously creating powerful, amazing works time after time after time? Yeah, you know what, it's, it's a good question. First of all, what's happening, everybody good? Yeah! Uh, look good? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. You know what, I, I'll tell you, you want, the, you want the truth, the honest answer? We want the truth. All right, so, look, I, part of it is just, work, none of it's magic. Part of it's just work ethic. Right? I get up every single day, I do the same things every day. I'm very disciplined, right? I get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock every single day. I go to the gym, I make myself breakfast, I read the newspaper, and then by around 8.30, 9 o'clock, I'm sitting down and I work from about 9 o'clock to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Every single day. So I'm writing, I'm Monday through Friday. So I'm writing, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm researching, I'm doing all the things I need to do to make this. I'm writing about two to 3,000 words a day. Um, which, you know, which, which equates to a book every six weeks, right? It's eight weeks, if you're doing it that way. Now, the flip side of this, the other part, the truth about it, though, is that it's rooted in a certain kind of anxiety. It's rooted in a certain kind of compulsion, a, a bit of obsessiveness, right? Like, not everything is okay up here, right? And that's the truth, right? I, I gotta, some of us know what that's like. I have to do all the things to manage all that's happening in my head, but part of the thing that happens for me is there's a bit of obsession, there's a bit of like, I, because, because I come from what I come from, and I'm scared to go back. And so in order for me to like maintain the life that I've built, in order for me to make sure that all of you all might build the life that you're building, like something is driving me, and, and some of that is anxiety, some of that is fear, right? And then, and, and, and also the, the necessity and the requirement 
to be great, right? And, and to be excellent in whatever it is I'm doing. So it's a complicated balance, if I'm being honest with you. It's a complicated, and I could use a little rest, to be honest with you. Want to know what's funny is that's literally my next question, is how do you rest? Uh, poorly. Um, but but what, I, what I will say is, Sunday, all right, the main way I rest these days is, look, I'm lucky and I've, you know, my life is a beautiful life. And so I go to every single home team sporting event. So like I got, I'm a season ticket holder for the, for the Wizards, I'm a season ticket holder for the Commanders, I go to the Capitals, I go to the Nationals, I go, right, I live in DC obviously, right? So I go to every game um, because it's the only time that I'm not thinking about this stuff. Right, so like I'm going to watch the basketball game, I'm, I'm not worried about writing. And it's a part of my rest process. It's a part of what gives me time to sort of recharge. The other thing though is I go to the movies two or three times a week when I'm not traveling, just because I love the movies and it's, and it's like a quiet space and you can't use cell phones in there. So I get to shut it all down for two and a half hours and focus on something else. And then on Sunday mornings, every single Sunday morning I go see my mother and we sit at the table and we sort of have our moment, we have a little breakfast, read the newspaper, laugh and joke, and that's like the biggest like the biggest recharge for me. So I have all kind, and then I, you know, I got all kind of other regiments and things that I do to make sure that I, that I find moments of rest, but it's just not quite enough yet. But I'm, I'm working on it, right? We'll get there soon. A vacation soon, you know what I mean? Are you better? Yeah, soon, soon, soon. Better. And speaking of your mother, Isabel? Yeah, the great Isabel. The great Isabel. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day to your mother. I appreciate that. What'd you do special with or for your mother on Sunday? You know what? It's funny, because this year, her older sister turned 80 the night before. So we party. So when I went to go see her, she was like, I'm like, I ain't got it, son. Like, whatever you want to do, I ain't trying to do it. Like, I need to rest. I need, you know, she's 78 years old, partying like she's 17. And so, you know, that Sunday morning was actually a little rough for my girl. And so I brought her cards and flowers and did all the things that we normally would do. But it, we didn't do anything major this year. I'll, I'll take it at dinner. We'll do something fancy sometime soon. But she was, you know, going through it on that morning. <laughs> on that morning. She was trying to find her she rest. She was trying to figure it out. Got it. Got it. Uh, a very popular question. Okay. Three words. Long way down. Yeah. Why is it written in verse? And why did you end it the way you did? Uh, why is it written in verse? It, so the original version of that book is not written in verse. It's a version that none of you will ever see. Um, I wrote it as like a standard sort of novel about this kid and all the things he's going through in the elevator. And it was like 300 pages and it was a lot. And my agent was like, yo, I love the story, but don't nobody want to read, like, if this is gonna, if this is supposed to happen in, in like one minute of this kid's life, I can't believe that if it takes me two weeks to read the book. So you gotta figure out how to speed this up. How do you make this work in a way where everybody who reads it feels like they're in the elevator with this kid? Um, and so I rewrote it in verse, because in verse I understood, I was like, oh, okay, well, the brain doesn't work in complete sentences, right? It, it's, it's, it's not actually the way that like our, you know, our human computers work. We don't function in like these smooth sentences. It's more like snapshots, right? And then the, your, your brain is doing the work to piece it all together, gets it down here, and then you, you communicate it in a complete sentence because you've been trained to do so. But before you were trained to do so, you would just throw out words, right? Eat, right? When a baby is hungry, eat, right? It's like you, you, you would do it this way. And so I knew that if I could like, Break the, break the story down into these sort of verses, that it would, it would actually sort of attach itself differently to the mind of the reader, because that's the way the mind works anyway. The other thing I knew is that if I could create more space on the page, then I can manipulate the language differently and then play around with the subconscious of whoever was reading. So because I'm a movie person, you study somebody like Alfred Hitchcock, who is famous, for those of you who don't know, got really famous for, right, for making all these like scary, scary movies in the 1960s, 70s, right, and 80s. And one of the things that he would do is he would like tilt the camera, right? It's like, I'll just have a regular scene, nothing scary is happening, but I'll tilt the camera a little bit because even though nothing scary is happening, the people who are watching this know something is wrong, but can't put their finger on why. They feel uncomfortable, but they, they, they can't quite explain what's causing discomfort. And it's just because there's something that is like dissonant to the brain. I did the same thing a long way down, right? If I move a word down here, what does it do to the brain? If I move a word over here, what does it do to the brain? If I break a word in half and separate the letters, what does it do to the brain of the reader, right? It's meant to cause a certain kind of discomfort, um, and you can do that more when you have more space on the page to play around with. Lastly, uh, in terms of why did I end the book that way, 
You know, it's funny because it's probably the question I get more than anything. That and like, what happens at the end? What's your answer to the question? Which, by the way, I'll never say. Um, I'll never, ever, ever give that up. But the truth is, is that I ended the book that way because I respect you. And I end every book. If you've read any of my other books, you'll realize that most of them end sort of in a similar way because I respect you. I feel like you always got to be careful um, with anybody who gives you the answers because people who give you the answers believe that you can't get the answers yourself, that you don't have the ability, the capabilities, the, inter the intellectual capacity to use your logic and your reasoning skills to find the answer. What we adults all know about you is that you do have the ability to do this. I've given you 250 pages of story. I'm asking you to write one page, form an opinion based on the evidence I've given you about what happens to this kid on this final page. I shouldn't have to do that for you, and I love you too much to answer the question for you because you got that in you. You can do that yourself. And there's no wrong answer, by the way, for young people. For adults, there is a wrong answer, especially if you teach our children. I ain't gonna hold you. If you're an adult in this room and you read that book and you said that that kid dies and you teach that kid every day and you could have saved his life, well, yeah, well, I got questions for you. So do I. I got, I got questions for you. The babies get to choose whatever they want. The scholars can say any answer they want is theirs to choose. For you, though, you gotta ask yourself some hard questions about your biases when you teach our babies just like that kid every single day and you, you could have easily chose his life and you chose his death. That's a, different, that's a different thing. And so I knew it would be a social experiment, experiment for the adults and for the kids. It was meant to be something to push you and challenge you to activate your imaginations and your logic and reasoning skills. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all caught, did y'all catch all those nuggets? Y'all caught all that? So, my brain operates in tangent. So you already said you watch movies to rest and then the, your answer's gonna segue me to the next one. So what movies, drop some, what should we be seeing? What's, uh, what's a recommendation you have of a, of a good movie right now? You know it's a really brilliant film that nobody has seen, it came out a couple years ago. There's this movie called Wendy, and it was a small independent movie. You can find it on, on The Things, right? I think, <laughs> I, think, I think it's on Netflix, I think it's on Apple. It's, you can find it on The Things, you can find it on YouTube, right? And it's basically a retelling of Peter Pan. But Peter's a little black boy from Antigua. What? It's genius. Wendy? Called Wendy. And this little black boy, who is Peter Pan, but like not. Like he is, cause he is. But not in the way that we're used to seeing Peter Pan. We're not in the way of, like there's no, there's no Tinkerbell. There's no sort of like, there's no magic, except for the magic of black children. Like the magic of what it is that we already have. But it's, the, it's a retelling of this story, but it's, it's just a different way to think about like imagination and growing up and the adventures of our lives in a way that I've never seen before. It's a powerful film. So I watched that movie probably once a month. I watched, I've probably watched that film 60 times. Now I'm going to as well. Sure. And I promise you, as an educator, first of all, you're gonna be a mess, but I, I promise you, it'll, it's, it's, like a, it's like a chemically changing kind of, it's like, oh, I'm not the same anymore. Watch that film. Good to know. Anybody else gonna be dueling, finding Wendy find on it's all dope. the things? It's, it's dope, it's dope. <laughs> so speaking of movies, you've got lots of flexes, right? Uh, Ambassador of young adult literature, yeah. multiple million times, New York's best selling, all of the things. Mm -hmm. And you have Marvel. Mm -hmm. Like just a part of your Wikipedia. Yeah. Like that happened. That happened. Like how? Uh, they called me. They call me. You know what's funny? I, I'm gonna tell you the truth. The truth is, is that like, it is a flex, but it's the flex that I, that I like the least. I know it's a, it, and I'll tell you why. But I, you know what? First of all, let me say this. I love Miles. I love what I made, right? I love sort of what what he became because of the things that I made. I love all of that. Um, but you know, I don't own Miles. Miles isn't mine. Right? Like Marvel owns Miles. So Marvel called me, this is a true story, they called me on the phone because they can get anybody's phone number. And I answered the phone and they like, yo, we got this, um, this character that we made that we can't get to work. They couldn't get Miles to work. Miles was already out, they had put out six comics, six issues of the comic book. And it was like, if anybody's read the original Miles Morales comics, you know that they're super like watered down. 
right? They basically were trying to make, like, take Peter Parker, paint his face brown, and that'll be it, right? And there's, like, a moment, and, and I'm like, yo, I don't, this is, this is corny, and I'm not interested. So I say no. And they're, like, confused because nobody says no to Marvel. And I'm like, I'm cool, I'm good. I go out of town and do an event in Tulsa, Oklahoma, talking to some shorties out there, some kids, and they like, yo, the teacher's like, yo, we got a bunch of boys in ISS, right, in school suspension. Before you leave, can you pop in and say what's up to them? I'm like, yeah, no problem, woo, woo, woo. I go in, I'm like, what's up, y'all, what's going on? We talk for a little bit, and they're like, yo, what you working on? I'm like, man, I just finished Long Way Down, this, da, 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 like, this is going on. <clears throat> and they're like, and I'm like, and I just got a call from Marvel to do this Miles Morales book. And they're like, who's Miles Morales? because no one knew who he was at the time. And I was like, apparently, he black Spider-Man, right? He half black, half Puerto Rican, right? Like, he from Brooklyn, you know? And they're like, what? It's a black Spider-Man? He like us? He come from where we come from? He in the hood? He eat what we eat? Do we wear Jordans? Do we all this stuff, right? And I'm like, I don't, I'm like, I don't, I don't really know, but if this is something that y'all are interested in, they're like, bro, yes. <laughs> so I call Marvel and I say, send me all the comics. They send me the comics they have, and I'm reading the comics, and there's one part in issue number three where his suit gets ripped, and there's a girl who's filming it with her cell phone as he's flying through the air, and she zooms in and has a YouTube video, and she says, oh my gosh, this Spider-Man is brown. And he's watching the YouTube video in his dorm room, and his response is, what does it matter? And in that moment, I realized, oh, they getting this all wrong. They getting this, of course it matters to us. Of course it matters, right? So I call Marvel back, I'm like, all right, I'll take the gig, but you gotta let me do whatever I want. That was the bargain. I look back on it now and it's like, what kind of person does that, right, to, to Marvel? But, but like, when you, when, you, when you know they need you, when you, like, y'all, what I love about y'all is that, like, y'all really understand that you're the, at least I hope you understand, and if you don't, I'm finna tell you, y'all are the arbiters of culture. What I, what I mean by that is, don't nothing move without y'all. Nothing in culture, right? Whatever's fly, whatever's new, whatever's hot, whatever music style, whatever's going on, even if the adults don't get it, it's moving forward, and it has everything to do with y'all. They need you way more than you know, right? They making all that money on you on your intellectual property, your imagination, your fly, your style, all of that, you, all them dances y'all be making up, they making money on you, right? So I tell Marvel, I ain't doing nothing unless y'all let me do it the way I wanna do it. And they're like, all right, let's hear, let's hear your ideas. And I, and I told them, uh, basically, so this is a secret, I'll tell you all, now you'll know, but I grew up down the street from, uh, like around the corner from Kevin Durant. I mean, Kevin Durant was growing up, and you go see him play, and you be around him. Kevin Durant was always the Kevin Durant he is now. Kevin Durant was always sort of like on his own way, doing his own thing, very focused on who he wanted to be. And when he got drafted, all of us in the neighborhood were like, oh, he, like, that's a superhero. If you go from being a kid living in a one-bedroom apartment in the projects to a person who's worth $300 million, and you come from where we come from, you a superhero, right, to, to us, right? So, so I was asking myself, man, I wonder what it was like for Kevin to have to manage a superpower that he never asked for, a superpower that he didn't even believe he deserved. How do you come back to the neighborhood and be on the same block knowing that your life is completely different? How do you deal with the guilt of surviving? How do you deal with feeling inadequate because you're the only superhero you know, even though your mama it, it has given you more superpowers than any spider bite will ever give you? If we make him black, this is what I told Marvel, if we, if we keep him the way he is, a half black, half Puerto Rican boy from Brooklyn, Spidey sense is no longer a superpower, it's a survival skill. Everybody in here got it. Y'all know what it is to know when the bad thing is coming before the bad thing gets to you. We've all been in the room and been like, hey, I think it might be time to go. Hey, I think it might, hey, let's look like it's getting ready to get funky in here. It's time to book it, right? We know what that's like. Our mothers and fathers have given us that kind of game. That ain't no superpower. That's what it is to be from where we are from. That's what it is to be black in America, especially if you're living in, 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 a, in, a, in a condensed population of working class people. You better know how to, how to move, right? Same with, like, what, is it, what does it mean to put on a mask and be invisible? Take off your mask and still be invisible. Only we know that, right? He had camouflage as a superpower, like we do, right? Like, we know how to move in any kind of room. We code switch with the best of them, unfortunately, but it is what it is. We have to survive. So I knew that if I took him on, I wanted to show him as an actual black teenage boy 
navigating the, the two worlds of his rich white school and his neighborhood and his parents, because we all come from, most of us come from parents who are like, when I was growing up, I speak for myself, and I know you know this, where it's like, Ma, I want to do this, this, that, and the third. And your mother say, like, I want to save, save the world. My mother's going to be like, boy, you better save these grades first. <laughs> then, then you're going to save this household. Then you're going to save the block. Then you're going to save the whole neighborhood. After that, we're going to work on the city. Every black person you ever met, then we can figure out how we're going to save the world. That's typically how it works, right? And I wanted to put all of that in Miles' story and his sneakers and all the other things. And I did that, and it's, and it's fine. And they made the movie and made him who he became based on all the things that I made, made the video game, using all of my stuff for the video game. And, you know, I ain't see a dime, just so y'all know. So when it comes to why I won't do it again or why I'm done with it, it's because it's bad business. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of, but, I, but I, this, this, this is a gold mine. And it ain't for free. So it is what it is. I'm glad y'all got what y'all got, but I ain't gonna get no more from me. And that's just what it is. And I hope all of y'all move like that too. Your brain, intellectual property protected. Okay, this next question. I have been waiting um, two months to ask. Uh, you are a scholar of hip hop. Mm -hmm. You are a master of letters. I know you hip on what's happening or what has been happening, even though in my mind it's decided, but I kind of want to know if I still love you the same way. Kendrick or Drake? Uh. who I think won the battle. Is that what the question is? That's why you're genius. Good job. Is that okay. the question? Yeah. The question is, yes, who do you think won the battle? Kendrick, I mean. <laughs> I, I think, I, honestly, honestly, I think, I think it was, uh, I think it was an example of, 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 honestly, I think this is what happens when you plan. You know what I mean? And, I, and it's funny because we're around young people all the time, and this is what we're always trying to explain. And of course, they don't want to hear it because we old and they like, you don't know nothing. But like, what we got to witness was like, this is what happens when you plan. This is what happens when you strategize, right? So like, a lot of times in school, we're learning like, what we're learning, obviously, but really what we're trying to, what, what I think so many of us are trying to teach y'all is like, what are the steps it takes to be the thing you want to, how do you plan? How do you know, because you know something bad's coming you know there will be conflict, there will be problems, that's life. How do we plan to make sure that you can just like, right, you can, you can bob and weave in a way, right? And I think what we witnessed was Kendrick being very prepared and understanding exactly who his opponent is and knowing exactly what his opponent was gonna do and being ready to counteract, right? We know who our opponent is too, right? We know exactly what it is and who it is and, and the systems that exist. What are you going to, you know what's coming. There will be some no's and some rejections and some looking you up and down to figure out if you're worthy of being in any room. Are you prepared? Have you done the work, right? Because that's what, that's, to me, that's what was most impressive, right? Now, that being said, because I, I think he wiped the floor with, with old boy. Seriously, and, I, and honestly, I think, and honestly, it's weird because I think he actually may have damaged this person's career in a very real way, which is a wild thing to see, right? Because Drake was sort of like, you know, an untouchable figure for so long, and he got picked apart. But if you're asking me, 10 years from now, which, which of their songs will still be being played, it's, it's tricky. Now, Kendrick got They Not Like Us, that's a hit, hit, hit record, right? It's a specific song, especially if you're from the West, that's a hit record, right? But I'm curious to see, I think about, I mean, we, we've been alive long enough to see Nas and Jay-Z. Nas won the battle hands down. Ether is a, one of the greatest diss tracks of all time. But no one's gonna tell me it's a better song than Takeover. Honestly, as a piece of music. And that's, and that's okay. But when we talked about the battle, I mean, this, was, this wasn't close. You know what I mean? Shout out to Kendrick Lamar for, uh, you know, 
And, and I know your, your besties with Wale, so there was a moment where I was kind of like, uh-oh, uh-oh. He ain't, he ain't getting it. <laughs> right. He don't want no problem with none of them. <laughs> Shout out to Wale. Okay, so before I open this to the future Jasons in the gym, you are looking at a gymnasium full of, in my opinion, young Jasons of all genders. Young creators, young brilliant geniuses, engineers, professors, authors. Literally anything you all want to do, you have everything inside of you to do it. But you don't always get the opportunity to hear from someone like Jason Reynolds. So my question to you is if you could tell them, what do you want them to hear from you specifically? What do you want them to hear from you that only you can say? So this is a good, this is a good question. All right, let me take a second because I, I really want to make sure that I seize the opportunity to to really love on y'all in a way that you won't forget. Here, here, number one is this. Young people have, uh, you all, have a very specific ego. It's something that comes with being a teenager. It's something that makes all of us very upset, but I'm going to beg you to hold on to as much of it as you can. The truth of the matter is, is that everything you feel, not all of it is wrong. A lot of it is right. A lot of what you're feeling are real feelings, and a lot of the things that you think are wrong are actually wrong. Um, there's just a lot more to the story, but the ego that says that you know better, the ego that says that you, that, as, I know it's some kid in here who's like, yo, I'm him, right? Or it's me, I'm her. And if that's how you feel about yourself, I hope you always feel that way. Because everybody will try to convince you that you're not him, that you're not her, right? And so the first thing I would say is protect some of that, right? You, uh, that's what propelled me to, to where I am. I was 19, 20 years old, really believing that couldn't nobody outright me. Was I right at the time? No. There were people who could outright me. But, but the belief that I had in myself, the way I felt about me, it was like, yo, I'm nice. <laughs> right? I know I'm nice, right? When I was young, right? I, now, I mean, I've been kicked around a lot these days. But like, when I was young, that, that, that sort of arrogance of youth can be a superpower if you understand how to use it, right? So the first thing I would say is hold on to that, but just learn how to wield it better, right? Don't aim it at your teacher. Don't aim it at your, right? Figure out where to put it. But once you figure out where to put it, you out of here, right? Number two, nobody wants to live in a world where young people ain't making adults mad. Your job is to be irreverent. It's a part of your, it's a part of like what comes with being young. We don't like to tell you this because it makes our lives more difficult. But the truth of the matter is, you being irreverent, you shaking the table, you saying, I don't like this, I want something different, I don't think this works anymore, I think that that's old school, we want something fresh for us, something that feels tailor-made for who we are, for this generation, we use this, we do that, we listen to this, we wear this. Like, I understand all of that. You're supposed to shake the table. If you're not shaking the table, if we love everything you do, you're doing something wrong. In order for the world to continue to change, y'all gotta make a mess of it. That is the point, and it never feels good for an adult. My grandfather, my mother always tells us stories about how my grandfather couldn't stand Dr. King because he was a frightening figure for an older person. Dr. King was a rebel rouser who he thought was gonna get his children murdered. But every generation, that's the way it's supposed to go, right? He, he wasn't supposed to understand. But my mother, who was his generation, was like, I think you're wrong. I think he knows something, and I think he's gonna do something that you couldn't do, right? You got us this far, but this, this young knucklehead is getting ready to push us a little farther. This is your job. Make us upset, but just know there's a difference between being irreverent and irresponsible. What is the difference, you ask, right? What is the difference? The difference is actually quite simple. The difference between those two words, being irreverent, which is pushing back against the norm, and being irresponsible, simply boils down to intention and planning. Do you know what you're mad about, or are you just screaming? Because don't nobody got time for a whole bunch of hollering if you don't know what it is you're hollering for. Do you know what the change is and uh, what you want to change, or are you just mad things ain't the way you want them? It don't matter if you're like, this don't work. Well, then what is the solution, young person? What is the new option? <laughs> Provide us with what's supposed to happen next to make it better for you. 
Give us some ideas. You can't just be hollering about how mad you are if you don't have a, a better option. That requires planning, thought, intention. That requires coalition with the people around you. That requires intergenerational relationships, meaning you can't hate all your teachers because you need them. You need some OGs in your life, especially the ones who you know loves you and everybody in here knows which ones love you, right? Keep them close. Keep them close, right? That's a real thing. And, and I think, I think lastly, I think lastly, I think that my last piece of advice, my last thing I, I would want you to know is excellence is a habit. Excellence is a habit. I meet people all the time and they feel like they can turn it on and off. Not if you really want to be great, you can't. If you're going to be excellent, you're going to be excellent in all parts of your life. It doesn't mean you have to be the best, but you have to give your best. And everything, you got to give your best as a, as a, as a daughter or a son to your parents. You got to give your best as a student. You got to give your best as a friend, as a brother, as a, as a, as a partner, as an employee someday, as an owner of a business someday, as an artist, an athlete, whatever you, whatever you want to do, you got to give it your, you got to give it your all because excellence is a habit. And once you get in the habit of excellence, you won't know any other way. The, and, when, and once you don't know any other way, failure is no longer an option. It's not a thing. It's not a possibility. It doesn't exist in your realm, right? You don't think about it that way. Right? Which means, which means, by the way, that you all have to get comfortable with difficulty. Here's the thing, and I'll end it here. I love y'all so much. I think y'all are the smartest generation we've ever seen. I just, I just don't, I just, I just don't always, I just don't always know. Thank y'all. I just don't always know if, if y'all actually believe it yet. And I think what happens because of this, this sort of break in belief is that every time something gets complicated in your life, every time somebody gives you some work that's a little bit difficult, every time you try something that you're not good at immediately, y'all fold up. And the truth is, in order for you to be anything in this world, y'all gonna have to get comfortable with difficulty. Adults come to work every day in this school and love on y'all, and y'all have no clue on what's happening in their households. You got no clue of what they've had to jump over to get here to love on you. And you know why you don't know? It's because they're okay with the fact that life gets hard because there's still a job to do. And they still have to manage the job that they have been sent here to do. So, so as you all move on and get out of here, don't be scared because it got hard. Y'all give it up for Jason Reynolds, please. speak this is my third time and every single time you have spoken words to my life that has helped me to love on these babies a hundred thousand fold so thank you please give it up for him again so I can get my eyes to Listen to all of the instructions. There is a microphone here. Don't get up, nobody get up yet. <laughs> There's a microphone there. Only one person at a time. And when we say the time is up, the time is up. You have to love it and respect it, okay? So if you have a question, please come gingerly, respectfully to a microphone. That's right, it's not enough to just raise your hand. Come up. All right, we got our first three. All right. Remember one mic. Cyan's got the first question. And after, I think it's Jeff T, we'll pause and then we'll see what we have time for. Go for it, Cyan. My question is, what's your biggest motivation to stay on task in life in? Keep pushing to be successful. Uh, my mom, my mom, and y'all, right? I'm around y'all all the time, and I see what it is, and I just, I'm like, let me do my part, right? But also, I got OG. My mother, my mother been through 
things that I'll never go through. And so if she never quit, I don't have an excuse, right? So she keep me motivated. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna try to get as many answers as possible, so we're gonna run them through. Hi. How you doing, man? My question is, what makes fiction so powerful for um, young people like us? Oh, that's, 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 a, good, that's a good question. I think, um, number one, uh, depending upon, fiction is broad, right? There's many different kinds of books that a person can read. So either you're reading about something that you directly connect to, right, which is always important. And the other thing that happens is that you're reading about something that you don't connect to, which means you're learning about the world around you in ways that don't require as much money to go and travel to see, right? You get to know what's happening in this neighborhood, in this part of town, without you having to go there. Most importantly, though, reading fiction is the only thing that will train the brain. And what I mean by that is, when you're reading, the act of reading, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights for your mind. It's the only thing that'll teach you discipline, persistence, consistency. It'll teach you, imagine, it'll keep your imagination sharp. It'll broaden your vocabulary. The more words you got, the less you have to use these, right? And most importantly, it'll teach you how to listen to yourself, because it's your voice you hear when you're reading, not mine. And you're gonna need to recognize that voice as you get older, all right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, what inspired you to make the book Ghost? Oh, Ghost. Um, publishing company was trying to get me to write a uh, book about uh, basketball players. And I was like, you know we do more than play basketball, right? So I was like, that's weird. And I wanted to write about um, what it feels like to run. And for, you know, everybody in here who has ever run, which all of you have run at some point in your life, you know that it feels terrible, right? And in order for you to be good at running, you gotta be okay with feeling like you're finna die, right? That's why adults don't be running no more, right? And so I wanted to write about young people who, who got comfortable with feeling like they were suffocating. And I based it on a, one of my best friends, Matt Carter, who ghost really, that really happened to him when he was a kid. His father tried to shoot him and it was a whole. And so that's where that all comes from. Um, shout out to, to my man, shout out to ghost. Um, I was wondering why does black representation matter to you so much? Because everybody be acting like we ain't it. Like, you know, you know what's wild about, about being a black person specifically, and, and all over the diaspora, right? So whatever version of black that you are. That's the other thing. We, blackness is broad. It's huge, right? Blackness is, is a, I like to consider us a neon color. Right? I think we glow in the dark in ways that people don't quite understand. And I, think, and I think we have the history to stand on, but more so we have the present, and even more so we have the future to stand on because of people like you. And I'm just tired of people acting like we ain't it, when really, we always been it, and everybody know we it, they just be lying to us, trying to convince us that we not, but we really be making everything go out here, right? That's all, and I just want to celebrate ourselves. You know, why not, you know? Yeah. What's your favorite book that you've written and what's the favorite book that you've written? My favorite book that I've written is The Boy in the Black Suit. Uh, I love that book. It's like, a, it's like a special book for me. Yeah. And it's personal, because it's super personal. It's about like a lot of stuff that I went through and it's, that's my favorite book. And my favorite book that I've read, oof, I've read a lot of books. Probably is a book called Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward that I think is the best book of the, of the 21st century. And I think all of you in here, that's a book that y'all, that's a masterpiece. Salvage the Bones. You got it. In a video, I watched you talk about your mom helping you with a date and making lasagna. Yeah. Is your mom the reason for the cookbook Matt's mom made him in The Boy in the Black? Yeah, yeah, but I got the recipe wrong. Yo, you know what's wild? Yes, yeah, she is. But I got the cookie recipe. Don't make them cookies in that book, because that recipe, them cookies are going to be dry. Don't make them cookies. Because uh, I showed my mom, and she was like, this ain't right. This ain't the recipe. But yes, my mother is... My mom is, I, I was lucky, I'm, I've been very fortunate. My mom is the coolest human being. And she definitely was like giving me, you know, giving me game as a kid, making lasagna for my girlfriend and all that. You know, she was cool. She, yes, shout out to my mom. I will, I, you know, listen, shout out to my mom. Yes. 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 How, did you get your, how did you get your book deal? How did I, oh man. All right, let me try to run a quick, a quick version of that story. How did I get my book deal? So remember when I was talking to y'all, I just was mentioning like the, the, the ego of youth, right? Like all of y'all in here know that y'all, it's like, yo, I'm the best person to ever, you know what I mean? I really felt that way. And when I was a 16, 17 year, uh, 18 year old, I, me and a buddy of mine took out a loan, took out, you could get credit cards back then. You remember this, you can get high limit credit cards for signing your name on a paper. And they gave me basically $20,000 limit. 
and on a credit card. And I swiped the credit card and had this book made that cost us $30,000 to make. And I made this book of like poetry and art and all this stuff. And I went to New York City and I'm trying to figure out how to get this book in the hands of the right people, but nobody will look at it because that's not how you get a deal. But we didn't know how to get a deal and the internet wasn't the internet yet. So we had to open up phone books. Y'all know what a phone book is? <laughs> it's okay if you don't, it's okay. So back in the day, so back in the day they used to, so like, you know how adults always be getting on y'all about social media, about like protecting your privacy and protecting your identity? This is what you say back to them. They used to deliver phone books to each individual's house. And in that book was everybody's phone number and address. So if you wanted to find anybody's phone number or address, you could just open up a book and be like, let me just find, let's go to the A's. Or let me, let me go to the R's and find Jason Reynolds' phone number. And that. So we had to do it that way, find all these publishing companies, run around, nobody gave us a chance. And then eventually, because of a friend, he gave it to a, a person who gave it to a friend, and this lady read it and was like, yo, this is cool. Anybody willing to invest this much in themselves, I at least want to take a meeting with. And that's how I got in the industry. So it was like a backdoor situation. It, it, was, a, it was like a weird, unconventional way. The point is, hustle, 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 hustle. Yeah. Yeah. When you were in high school, was passion, like your passion for writing always there? And if it wasn't, or if it was, what was your favorite piece of your writing? Oh, uh, in high school, yeah. I, you know, it's funny, because in high school, I wasn't a very good student. I was kind of a knucklehead and was a little all over the place, but I loved to write um, because it gave me uh, it gave me purpose. Back then, nobody was trying to do it. Do this. I was I was supposed to be an athlete. I was an athlete. I ran. I wrestled. Played basketball. Did all these things. Right. Even when I was in high school, but I really liked knowing that nobody else was writing poetry. And back then, all my friends would be like trying to be rappers. And they would all stand around each other and rap to each other. If y'all know any boys who are rappers, this is what they do. They stand around each other and rap to each other. And I would, and, and, and I was always confused. And me being like a 16-year-old boy and, this, and a 16-year-old heterosexual boy, which is important to know, I was like, bruh, all of y'all standing around each other rapping and all the girls on the other side of the room. So I'm going to write these poems and see, and see what's finna happen, right? That's what really happened. Um, and, and that's who I really was in, in high school. So, you know, you know, for all of that, I'm trying to get y'all some game. I'm trying to help you, you know? Hey, what, what was mean? your favorite piece of your writing? My favorite piece of my writing? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm old now. I can't remember that. That's a long... I hope nobody ever sees none of that stuff. It was all terrible, you know what I mean? But uh, my favorite piece of writing these days that I've made... My favorite book is Boy in a Black Suit, but the, the best writing I think I've ever done is in either Patina or Look Both Ways or, like, those books I think I like. The best writing, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you think ego? Do you think ego impacts success for everybody? I think I think that ego. Let me tell you something. I think that ego is um, is like everything else. Too much of it is destructive. Just enough of it is propellant. Just enough of it, right? I think that when we think of ego, sometimes we're all, first of all, everyone has ego, right? We all have ego, right? And I think that when we think of ego, we only think of the negative. But that's because of an overdose of it, right? But at the end of the day, I want you to stand in front of me with your shoulders back and be like, yeah, like I'm confident up here to ask this question. That has, that, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing walking around knowing that you believe in yourself more than anybody else believes in you. I hope you do, right? I hope you believe in you. Don't wait for them to believe in you, right? You got, to, you got to know. Now, does that mean you should mistreat people? No. Does that mean you're better than anyone? No, you are not. Does that mean anyone's better than you, though? No, they are not, right? And that's how that works, you know? So, so I think a healthy bit of ego, ain't nothing wrong with it. Let me tell you something. I'm a writer for a living, and it's the most complicated thing in the world when it comes to ego because it requires an absolute amount of humility to make something and, get, and the insecurity that comes with that, knowing that everyone will judge it. And it also requires an awful lot of ego to believe that I got a story I think everybody need to read, right? Both of those things coexist. Got me? Got you, all right. So what compelled you to make Stump Boy? What? Captain Under so the question is what compelled me to make the book Stump Boy, Captain Underpants? Yeah, I, I was, it was the pandemic, I couldn't, my brain wasn't working, I couldn't read nothing. 
because back like my concentration was all messed up, right, because of the pandemic. So I went to the bookstore, bought all the Catherine Underpants books because they were the only thing that I could actually get through. I read all 16 Catherine Underpants books and thought to myself, why he get to have a whole corner? Why he corner the market and get to have, he's the only person who's done it that way. And so I was like, let me write my version of Captain Underpants, you know what I mean? And that's, that's where Stumpboy comes from. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to say that we all had to wear black oh. so we could all look beautified <laughs> that's what's up. as a test grade. That's what's up. And <laughs> by Miss Fernandes right there. I like it. I appreciate no, that. I appreciate that. Y'all look good in your black, you know what I mean? You know. I don't know if y'all know this, but this is it for me. Like, my whole closet looks just like this. You know? I've only worn black clothes, plain black clothes, for 20, what, 12 years, 13 years. That's it, yeah. And I was wondering what was your, like, reason for the extended metaphor in the book of, like, the game of Declare War and um, oh, yeah. chess. Yeah, you know, so that came from, that's a good question. So for those of you who haven't read The Boy in the Black Suit, there's a part in the story where he's, our main character is playing uh, I Declare War with his OG. Um, but this is New York City, and in New York City, everybody plays chess, right? All the kids learn chess when you're young, all the old heads play chess, everybody plays chess. It's like the, that's like their game, because they believe that if you understand the game of chess, you understand the game of life, right? Because chess is all about tactics, strategy, planning, foresight, right? Like vision, being able to see ahead, uh, and, you know, and a bit of ruthlessness, right? Like, it's, it's a war game. But I don't know if it's truly the way life works. It's the way we hope like life works. It's the way we think life works. It's the way that like life would, would work if we could make those decisions. But the truth of the matter is, is that every day each of us just turning the card over, hoping for the best. Every day is a day where I'm like, look, today I, I pulled a, a four and you pulled the eight, so the day is your day and it's not mine. But tomorrow, because I still got cards in my deck, I still got a chance to get, a, to get an eight or a nine or a 10 or an ace. Right? And I'm okay with that, right? That's life. As long as you got cards in the deck, as long as you got cards, then, then, then the next day could be your day, right? As long as there's cards. Now, people sometimes are like, well, I mean, like, what if I go on a string of, like, low cards? Just keep flipping them cards, because that will happen. It's happened to me, it's happened to your teachers, it's happened to your parents, right? But there's their high cards coming if you just keep turning. Don't quit, just keep turning, right? That's, that's closer to life than any game of chess, you know? So that's where it comes from. All right. Yes, give it up for that answer. We have time for, and I, I, I like, it's going to break my heart if Daniel doesn't get to ask his question. Oh, so, yeah, nah, Daniel got to ask his question. Yep, so we're going to cut off after Daniel and... I know. And Kingston. So everybody behind Kingston, I love you, but no. Sorry, y'all. I love you so very much. Sorry, y'all. Nope. I love you. Go for it, Kingston. Um, what pushed you or motivated you to um, start writing, and how did you become successful in your writing career? Yeah, but what pushed and motivated me to start? Uh, I thought I was gonna be Michael Jordan. It became painfully clear I was not gonna be Michael Jordan. And I needed to figure out um, what I was gonna do with all the, like I had like a lot of stuff. You know how sometimes you're young, and when you're older, you got a lot of stuff going on, and you can't always talk about talk about it, and back then I, I didn't always feel safe to talk about it, um, and so writing gave me a place to put it, right? Whatever's in your body that you know is causing discomfort, you gotta get it out or it'll make you sick, right? If any of y'all walking around with knots in your stomach, any of y'all got anxiety, any of y'all got stress, depression, and any of the things that happen to us mentally that, that cause our body to feel certain ways, you got to figure out how to get that up off you or it'll make you sick. That's real, right? It can become a poisonous thing. Writing was the way that I was able to do that. Um, and then as far as like the writing career thing, that just, it just kind of happened over time. You do something long enough, you get good at it, you know? Thank you. My question is just really quick, and it's personally really important to me. <laughs> do you listen to Kanye, and if so, what's your favorite song? Yeah, that's cool, it's a good question. So here's, here's, here's my thoughts on Kanye. Do I listen to Kanye? I do not listen to Kanye any, anymore, right? Um, and I understand that, like, we, look, it's music, and we all have our, our tastes and what we can rock with. Um, Kanye not my guy no more, right? Kanye was, though. I used to love Kanye in 2005, 2006, right? Like, the first three albums, 
our masterpieces. I would argue he's got two or three after that that are brilliant too. Um, but sometimes, you, you know, sometimes you wish your heroes just ain't say nothing. <laughs> right? It's like, like we, we, we really are no longer, like social media has made it so that everybody think that their opinion has to be heard. Yep. And the truth of the matter is it don't. Yep. Right? And you might get farther with your mouth shut. Like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reality, and I, he, he broke my heart because he talked too much now. And I don't, I don't want to know who he is. I just want to jam out. But now that I know who he is, I wouldn't let that man cut my grass. Right? That's just how I feel. Now, what's my favorite song? Uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of them from back then that I, that I love. Uh, what's one that I... You know what? He was the... All the opening songs to the first three albums are, make me feel... I mean, like, it's almost like gospel music to me. The, the, the opening songs of all three of those albums... Our, our masterpieces. But shout out to shout out to Yay. You know what I mean? Good job. All, All right, right, Daniel, you got the last one. All right, so my question: uh, You had an interview, I believe it was with Trevor Noah, yeah. and you said a quote that really stuck with me. You said that all the books inside of our hearts and inside of our minds. And all of the stories inside of us are just as important as all the stories that we read in, outside in the real world. Mm -hmm. My question is: What is one way that you was able to embrace one of your stories that was inside your heart? Other than writing. Yeah. You know, that's a big, that's a very good question. So I know you can be a good psychologist. It's a good psychology question, you know what I mean? Um, you say outside of writing. So, you know what? So let's have an honest moment before we get out of here. Something that I've been thinking about is what it means to be in this particular body. And what I mean by that is what it means to be a man. And lately, uh, over the last maybe four or five years, there are things about that that I've had to really assess as it pertains to whether or not I've been harmful to the people around me, specifically to women around me, right? And sometimes it doesn't feel good to look in the mirror and say like, yo, I, I benefit from being in this body. I benefit from like moving around the world as a man. It, 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 I, I can shift the energy in a room just because I'm in this body. People will listen to what I have to say differently just because I'm in this body, right? And I think we, we, we try to get defensive about this when we really shouldn't, right? I, and, and, and I think it requires, and, and it's a story that is in all, that story is in YouTube, by the way. And, it, and it's a story that we have to start editing now. You understand what I'm saying to you? It's a story that we have to start editing now. You're a, you're a senior in high school. This is the perfect time to start editing the story of masculinity, of what it means and what it does not mean, of whether or not it is harmful and who it has harmed, about whether or not we have been listening, if we're over-talking the, 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 the ladies around us, if we respect the women in our lives, if we respect ourselves enough to respect women, if we are allowed to cry, if you are allowed, you're a psychologist, you're gonna be a psychologist. So you gotta own emotion, um, it, it, to be an emotional person is to be a person. Don't let nobody tell you that you can't cry or you can't feel, because when you are fighting, you are still being emotional. So you can put that emotion somewhere else, somewhere where it feels a little better, and it's actually a balm to your, to your psyche, right? But these are stories that we all have, especially young men in the room, that we have to start owning now, and we have to start editing, and I, at 40, Right when I was 35, started to be like, yo, let me really take a good look at who I am. As a, I like to think I'm a good guy, but you can't get caught up in that. You can't get caught in that. You should ask the women around you how they feel about you. Have them tell you the truth about whether or not they're comfortable around you, about whether or not they hear what you say about them when they walk past, about whether or not they know that your eyes are on them when they walk past. Do you ever? Could you ever imagine what it is like to be a 13-year-old girl and that every and that every day for the rest of her life until she's 40, 50 years old when she walk out the house, she got to be concerned about you, about what you say, right? That's real, right? You gotta own that, all right? Like, do you get it? Like, like, give it up for Jason, the one and only Reynolds.